This is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of November 14th, 2022. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on both Facebook Live and YouTube Live, as well as via streaming audio from the show's website, weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday's show from 6.25 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages, also on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the projects page on national blog site, medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, we only had time to cover the first two of our three issues. First, we explain why, at least from the fiscal side, Moderate is the wrong word to describe who won the legislative election. Second, we discuss the next big fiscal issue facing the state, the whatever it takes drive to increase K through 12 spending. We'll get to the third issue, what impact the Willow and Pika oil projects are likely to have on this legislative session next week. And now let's join Michael. Well, Brad, we were just talking about the absolute exhaustion that many of us, I mean, I was exhausted last week anyway, just because of the, the whole thing, the COVID thing, but I think people are just wiped out and, uh, and, and they're frustrated. And you're going to give us a little bit of analysis today of, uh, you know, some of the discussion and talk around the moderates winning and all this kind of stuff. So I guess we'll start off there. What, um, what, what 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 are we gonna what are we gonna hit on here? Yeah, I'm I'm not sure I'm gonna relieve the uh, the exhaustion or the or the frustration, but but a little bit of analysis. I we're we're beginning to see a lot of articles that talk about moderate uh, moderates having won this election in Alaska, moderates having won the legislature um, in Alaska, and they go down through the list of either Democrat seats or or moderate Republican seat, moderate Republicans that that won seats. Um, and I and I want to push back a little bit on that. It, in Alaska, we tend to classify candidates based upon their position on social issues. Um, if they're socially moderate uh, or socially conservative or socially liberal, we tend to we tend to use that classification for uh, for them, uh, regardless of what their position is on fiscal issues. But fiscal issues are are entirely separate and have a different mix. And you can be fiscally you can be socially moderate and fiscally conservative. You can be socially conservative and fiscally liberal. There's, there's the, the two don't necessarily and often don't overlap. And, and I think it, we're, we're using the wrong term to describe on the fiscal side uh, what's, who we've elected in this, in this election cycle. There's, on the fiscal side, there's fiscal conservatives that, that believe in cutting spending and reduce and, and keeping spending down to essentially minimal uh, requirements. Then there's fiscal moderates who believe in spending more, but they believe in spreading the burden uh, across all those who, uh, who, who benefit, broadly, broadly basing the, the fiscal burden across all those. And then you have another category of, of, of fiscals uh, fiscal positions, and they sort of fall into two categories. One is the limousine liberals, the liberals who want to spend, but they don't want to pay for it personally. They want to shove the cost someplace else. And the plutocratic Republicans, who again are, are willing to spend as long as they don't have to pay for it, as long as they can shove uh, the costs off on somebody else, as long as their wealth enables them to, to, to avoid uh, uh, having to pay. And I think what, what we've elected this cycle, if you look across the board, is we've elected limousine liberals and plutocratic Republicans instead of moderate Republicans. You don't, or instead of, instead of moderates, you don't hear many people, uh, many candidates, very few candidates talking about 
we need to spend more, but we need a we need to broadly base the, the the revenue base so that it doesn't impact any given group unfairly. It doesn't it doesn't shift the burden to one group uh, or another. Sometimes you hear fiscal moderates talking about we're we're using a progressive income tax and that's too much uh, on uh, on the high end and that and that has that has bad repercussions and so we need to broaden the burden. Uh, more broadly, or sometimes you hear fiscal moderates saying we're we're pushing the burden too much down on middle and lower income Alaska family or families, and we need to broaden the burden. You don't hear a lot of that um, this election cycle. Instead, what you hear are people like Matt Clayman from the from the liberal side saying, uh, you know, that PFD that's not a that's not a big deal. That's not an important issue. We'll just use that to finance the additional spending that we that we want to undertake. Or you hear Kathy Giesel saying, oh, we can't have taxes. Uh, we need to spend more. We need to spend on K through 12, uh, but we can't have taxes. And so we need to we need to cut the PFD going forward. What you hear are plutocratic liberal plutocratic Republicans and limousine liberals uh, uh, that are out there uh, that, that campaigned and at least to this point in the, in the cycle appear to be appear to be ahead and appear to be at least a lot of people are giving them credit for, uh, for winning their races. So it's, I, I think, I think the press and, and I linked a Nat Hertz blog, um, to, for, for, you know, for reference point on this one, I, when I sent you the list, I, I, I think the press is doing a disservice to the state by, by terming the people who were elected on a fiscal, on the fiscal side as being, as being, moderates because they're not they're they're not none of them are are saying we need to spend more but we need to spread it over all Alaska, over all Alaska families so that the burden on any one family is relatively low they're not none of them are saying that they're all saying a variation of cut the pfd pay for it we need to spend more but cut the pfd and pay for it that way shoving the burden onto middle and uh, lower income Alaska families and i and i think what we need it is a recognition that we don't have, that we didn't elect fiscal moderates. We elected people who want to spend, and that looks like a moderate sort of, because moderates do want to spend, but they don't, but, but they don't fill the second criteria of moderate, which is we want to spread the burden over the broadest possible base in order to keep the, the burden on any given um, Alaska family uh, uh, low. They, all of them are trying to, all of them are trying to push the burden off on, off on middle and lower income Alaska families. To some degree, what we're setting up is a replay of the 20 teens, right? 2013, 14, 15, 16, 17. It's, it's, we need to spend, but, but we don't want to, we don't want to pay for the burden ourselves. So we need to shove it someplace else. In the 20 teens, we shoved it on future future generations. I mean, by draining savings, by using the savings that that was intent that's intended for all generations, by using the savings for this generation, we shove the burden off on future generations who will have to build up their own savings for when they hit their own uh, fiscal difficulties. Now in the 2020s, we're setting up a situation where we've elected candidates who are going to go in there and still say, I don't want to pay for it. We need to spend more, but I don't want to pay for it. And now the the, the burden is going to be shifted to middle and lower uh, lower income Alaska families. And that's just that's just not a moderate position. So I, I I push back and I and I think that that we would the Alaska press would benefit, the Alaska media would benefit by better describing uh, the positions of the candidates on fiscal issues instead of just just taking whatever their position is on social issues and applying it broadly across the candidate and, or just saying, oh, they want, they want to spend, so they must be moderate. I, I think I think we would be better served if the media went in and analyzed the actual fiscal position of the candidates who appear to be winning and analyze what their, what their position is on the revenue side, on the funding side, and realize that we don't have moderates, realize that we don't have people who are saying we need to spread the base we need to spread this burden broadly across all Alaska families. Realize that we have plutocrats on the Republican side and we have limousine liberals uh, on the Democrat side. I mean, this is what uh, I've said for, uh, we've been saying for quite a while here on the program that really that the party labels and really the moderate conservative labels almost don't apply anymore. This all comes down to 
are you pro government spend or are you pro private sector spend? Are you protecting, are you for protecting the private sector and the private economy, or are you for bolstering up the public economy at all costs? And that's, it's the same kind of thing, right? Right. It's, 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 it's in part that, and then if you're for bolstering up the government economy, how you're going to pay for it. I mean, you can be moderate, you can be moderate, you can fit the, the label of fiscal moderate if you're, you're for additional spending that you believe is needed, but you're willing to pay for it by, by spreading the burden broadly as opposed to shoving it on one class or another. You can, be, you can, you can fit the, the definition of fiscal moderate uh, if you do that. But we don't, have, we don't have anybody, we don't have any candidates that I'm aware of that are, that are arguing for that, that form of, of, of funding. I mean, what they're arguing for is, well, we got this other big pot of money. We used to have savings. We used to have a big pot of money in savings, and so we'll spend that down. And now we have this big pot of money that that is in the PFD, and we'll just and we'll just spend that down. So it's, um, it, it is in part, it is in part, you know, favoring government over the private sector. But even even when you favor government, you can still be moderate if you if you spread the burden. If your proposal is to spread the burden broadly, so that no one sector has to pay uh, uh, a, a huge amount or a disproportionate amount for it. We don't have that. that. That's not what's going on with uh, with with people who have been elected back to the legislature again. So I, I just I think it's a I think it's a misnomer. Again, on the on the fiscal side, I, I'm not, I'm not an expert on the social side, and I'm not even going to try to get into that. But but we tend we we what we what we're seeing is people who are uh, being ascribed the conservative or the or the moderate le- label. Uh, based upon their social position, position on social issues, as opposed to what right. they're actually arguing on the fiscal side. Well, can I ask you to sidebar for just a second, and maybe sure. we'll do this as a subcategory of one uh, of number one of the weekly top three. But y- y- explain to me why, in your mind, this is where we're at with this election. I mean, we we hear a lot of dissatisfaction. We saw a lot of dissatisfaction and frustration. And yet when push came to shove, a lot of those candidates who were more conservative in many ways, I mean, true conservatives, um, have gotten uh, have gotten the boot. And so what what are your thoughts on how the election has turned out and this move towards what is ostensibly a more moderate, right, uh, kind of thing, or maybe a more pro-government spend side of the world? What what give me your thoughts on why that that happened? I think I think it's a combination of things. One, I think um, I, I, I think the I, I think the perception is the last legislature failed to come come to grips with our fiscal situation, and they didn't deserve to come back. Um, I mean, Kathy Giesel made a big deal with uh, with Roger Holland uh, in arguing that he didn't solve anything. Um, that he was just there and he was, you know, tried to gut programs or tried to change programs, but he didn't solve anything. And I think it's a, a general frustration, the lack, to, uh, lack of coming to grips with the fiscal plan. I think that's, uh, I think that's lack of coming to grips with the solution to the situation that we face. I think that's one. Two, I think there is a perception that um, we need to spend more in certain areas and, and, and the Roger Hollands of the world and, and, and others weren't going to do that. Um, this plays out a lot in Fairbanks. I mean, I, I watched a couple of Fairbanks races closely, and I think there was the perception that we do need to spend more on K through 12. We do need to spend more on teachers, um, and and the conservatives just aren't going to do that. Uh, and so we need to find somebody uh, in our legislative races who's going to look out for our district, our interests. Uh, we need to find somebody who's who's going to do that, regardless of how they're going to pay for it. Um, and I think there was a perception that, that, that we do need additional spending in certain areas. And I think, uh, I, I think candidates made inroads by, by suggesting that, that they would, um, uh, take up that, uh, that flag and, uh, and, and push forward on spending. So a combination of, we didn't get a solution. We had, we had Dunleavy as governor. We had a concert, we had conservative, uh, uh, legislators. They didn't come to a solution. We're still facing this, the same issue, um, and, you know, and we need to be changing our road a little bit by spending a little more here and there. And, uh, and the conservatives aren't going to do it. So let's elect people. Let's elect people who are. 
So in part, what you're saying is that K-12 spending cry that we heard in a lot oh, of yeah. campaigns was effective. I mean, that was an effective message to to engage the electorate and get them involved because don't you you love children, right? You you don't you don't hate children. And uh, and and of course, they all need it, regardless of the analysis of how much we've spent or what we're spending right now or what we're getting for what we're spending. All none of that mattered. It was just it's for the children. I mean, that that kind of was the winner of this election cycle. Well, yeah. And you and I talked about it at the time. The first the headline, first headlines hit about Anchorage closing schools. I mean, that was that was that was going to be their closing drive. That was I don't know if it was an October surprise or a September surprise, but that was going to be the closing drive. And and I think we I think I talked about it at the time as being the, similar to the the National Guard controversy that that, you know, that, that took care of Parnell in 2014. You just heard about it every day and every day and every day and every day until the election. And so you had questions about, you know, what Parnell actually did uh, with respect to the National Guard issue. And here we heard about education every day and every day and every day. The, the difference is K, K through 12 is not going to go away. It's going to it's going to continue through the legislative session because the drive is going to be, as we'll talk about in the next segment, the drive is going to be uh, to, to expand K through 12. And then you're going to get the tag alongs. Oh, well, if we're going to expand K through 12, we need teacher retention. And if we need teacher retention, we need to find benefits for teachers. And then that's going to expand and we need to find benefits for more government. I mean, it's, it, it's, it's going to grow and grow and grow, but, but it was very effective. I mean, it, it, to, to the average mom and pop out there, to the average voter, seeing those headlines every day about closing schools, and I'm sure the schools were strategically chosen based upon election districts as opposed to something else. Um, uh, is closing schools uh, in Anchorage in particular, but you know the K through twelve. Then we had the articles about oh, this is not just an Anchorage issue; it's a statewide issue. Right, right, right. Fairbanks had to close issues; had to close schools last last year. You know, out in the Delta, out in the YK Delta, it's a problem. Up in Nome, it's a problem. Down in Southeast, it's a problem. It's just, I mean, yeah, that was that was a big driver, and I think uh, I think people responded to it. And the conservative response was, oh, we'll we'll fix that, but then. <laughs> but then they hadn't fixed. Um, we hadn't fixed the fiscal situation in the in the last legislature in the last four years. So right. What well, the, the surprise? The surprise really to me, sort of, and it shows it, it it shows to some degree how the role the valley plays in in electing governors because it's so deep red and it votes so strongly for Republican governors that it just sort of overwhelms the rest of the state. But the surprise to me is. Uh, one one legislator I talked to put it that we elected a Bill Walker legislature. Uh, the, the surprise to me is that we didn't elect is that is that they didn't go ahead and 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 elect a, a gubernatorial candidate. I, I think that's I think that shows how bad uh, uh, Walker was as a candidate and and how difficult a road uh, Les had uh, as a candidate. I think it also shows when you know one area of the state votes ninety to ten. Uh, in favor of a Republican candidate, the the rest of the state doesn't overwhelm it, can't overwhelm it. But it's um, uh, but the surprise sort of is, yeah, we elected a, a Walker legislature, but uh, but we didn't elect a Walker governor. So right. how that's going to play out is going to be an interesting issue as, as as we go through the next four years. But but right. but I but I but I think K through twelve was the was was a was a huge driver. Brad, you, you're hearing also, of course, we're hearing the the rumblings about the organization and what's going to be happening. And what it looks like right now is they're going to want to shut the conservatives out uh, in the Senate. I'm hearing that there's already basically a plan in place and that Shower and Hughes and, and uh, Myers are going to be basically sitting on their hands uh and uh their their the whole attempt is basically is to discredit them and move them over to the outside um i'm going to i'm going to leave you to the screen here for a second uh just wax poetic about uh, what you see as far as it comes to the uh, organization of the uh, of the senate and the house and give me your thoughts until until i return there you go <laughs> well on the on the Senate side, I think Michael, you're right. I think uh, uh, it looks like that is going to be a uh, a coalition. Uh, uh, the question is who's going to be headed by Gary Stevens is rumored to be the Senate president in one in one form. Uh, that makes sense to have a Republican uh, a Republican moderate uh, heading it up in one form. So uh, that's uh, uh, that seems to be uh, that, that seems to be the direction that the that the Senate's headed in. 
I think it will be disappointing if it's just Shelly, Mike, and uh, and Rob that are uh, in the that are in the minority. Uh, it'll if if Kaufman joins the the majority and if uh, uh, Jesse Bjorkman and and others uh, join the majority, I think they will regret the day when it comes to uh, future election cycles. But but that's their choice. Uh, that's their choice to make. I think I think I think they ought to show more conservative principles than, uh, than just joining uh, with uh, the coalition of the day. On the House side, um, it's certainly it's much, much un more unclear about what's going to go on over there. Uh, I, one analysis I, I, I have, have followed, uh, the theme of it is that uh, um, the, uh, uh, the House, the administration will push back and make the House different or try to make the House a, a Republican led co, a Republican led body so that uh, so that there's a, a not a coalition in both bodies, that they're not facing a coalition in both bodies. That gives the administration more credit, I think, than they've shown over the years and their ability to influence where the legislature goes. But 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 that's one theory. Um, I do think the Republicans will try to will try hard uh, to, to organize on the Republican side, but, uh, but, but Bryce is a, Bryce Edgman is a force on, on trying to pick people off and get people to come back over to a coalition. And, uh, and there are going to be Republican, uh, legislators, uh, that are going to be, uh, that are going to be, you know, susceptible to doing that. Um, either in either event, even if it's a coalition, I'm not sure that means that the, that the, so-called moderates or progressives or limousine liberals or however you want to classify them. Um, even if there's a coalition on both sides, I don't think that means that they run, run uh, wild. What it does put though, is a lot of, a lot more pressure on Dunleavy, uh, on the governor, on how he's going to push back, uh, and when he's going to push back. Uh, Dunleavy has, has shown the, the inclination to fight sometimes and not fight other times. And, and it'll be interesting to see if there is coalitions on both sides and they do pass a lot of, of, of moderate legislation uh, headed toward the governor. It'll be interesting to see how Dunleavy reacts to that. And that sort of goes back to the discussion we had, had last time, which is what's Dunleavy's plan for these next four years? Right. Does he want, does he want to leave a legacy? Does he want to build up? some sort of solution to the fiscal situation, or does he just want to rock along four more years, sort of like he has the last four years and sort of preserve whatever credibility he has uh, as, as just, you know, whatever, whatever his brand is um, and, and take on Lisa. If she wins this election, uh, take on Lisa two years after the, the end of his governor's governor's term. So I, um, it, there's a, there's a lot of unknowns clear, clear. I think it's clear that we'll have a coalition on the Senate side. It's just a question of how many members are in there, um, and on the Repo and on the House side, I, I don't think it's clear yet what we'll have. Uh, but uh, whatever it has, uh, whatever we whatever we end up with, I don't think we're going to have a huge amount of legislation that gets all the way through the governor. Well, and and I, I do not have the confidence that Governor Dunleavy is going to take the strong stance with the red pen if all these moderates get in there and are, you know, all these coalitions and, and uh, you know, limousine, like you're saying, plutocrats and limousine, limousine liberals, if they do all this stuff, I just don't have the confidence that he's going to go in there and be that bastion of fiscal conservatism that we hoped he would be. Um, because as you said, I think he might have eyes towards the, few, maybe not, maybe, maybe he does, but I don't have the confidence that he's going to step up and, and clip those things out quickly. If, if, you know, my hope would be probably unlikely to come about, but my hope would be if there is a push for spending on both sides, if for example, a K, a big K through 12 spending bill gets through and if defined benefits gets through. <laughs> I would hope Dunleavy would at least use that as an opportunity to fashion an overall fiscal uh, fiscal conclusion, fiscal uh, uh, resolution. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets, is our guest. And uh, we were just talking about the number one issue. Now on to number two, which, of course, is the next big spending thing. The next big spending thing is going to be 
that K-12 spend that we've been hearing about, how we're just not spending enough on children. We're just not spending enough on education. That's why our scholastic aptitude is so bad. That's why, because we can't retain teachers and we can't do this and we can't do that. And it's because we're not spending, en- I mean, we spend more than almost any other state in the nation, but we are not spending enough because we're unique and we need more money to make it work. Brad, uh, number two. Well, yeah. So that's going to be the push uh, that we need to spend more. We need to spend more on the BSA. We need to spend more, on, no doubt, on the adjusters. And 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 while we're at it, we need to go in and we need to fix teacher retention by notwithstanding the fact the entire country is having problems with teacher retention. You know, we're going to fix. We're going to fix it. We're going to fix all this teacher retention problem by by defined benefits uh, uh, by adding a defined benefits program and. And while we're at that, while we're fixing the teacher def- uh, re- retention program, why don't we go in and fix, you know, the troopers and everybody else? And why don't we just do defined benefits across the board and, and make everybody happy again? Um, so that's that. I mean, that that's going to be that's going to be the push on the spending side, and it's going to be a big push. And, and you can see from the election, you can see it from the headlines, you can see it from the Anchorage School Board. Uh, Elise Galvin was on uh, was on Alaska Public Media and talking about how we need to. You know, fix education by all this additional money. Here's here's where I think the soft underbelly of of that issue is, and and that is who pays. Um, I've had discussions with with people who have said, and when I've asked, you know, they they've talked about the need for all this spending, and my response is, okay, who pays? And well, you know, regrettably, we're going to have to use the PFD. Okay, so basically, you want middle and lower income Alaska families to pay. You don't want the top 20% to have to pay anything uh, toward it. Um, and, and so you're just going to shove it all off on middle. Well, I don't, I don't want to do that. I mean, that's unfair. If we're trying to, if we're trying to, you know, deal with kids, we ought to deal with families also. And, and, and I don't want to do that. All right. Well then, then we're, you're going to, you're going to, you're going to support a broad based funding for it uh, where everybody uh, contributes equitably toward the costs. Well, yeah, I don't know if I, if I don't know if I want to do that, but, but that's fairer. And so, and so, yeah, maybe we ought to, we ought to push for that. I think to me, and, and you'll hear a lot from me on this issue as we go through the legislature, I think that the real, the, the soft underbelly, the way to deal with this issue is to say, you don't, you shouldn't want middle and lower income Alaska families to have to pick up the entire, the entire burden. You, you should want to spread that burden equitably across all Alaska families. And when the top 20% realize that they're going to have to pay a share for, of that, when they realize they're not going to be able to just lean back and say, yeah, spend whatever you want, as long as we don't have to pay for it. If they, if, when they realize they're going to have to pay a share of that, they're going to kick in. The donor class is going to kick in and start pushing back on it. As I've said before, as we talked before on the show, you and I can spend all day, several days, every week, every month, you know, the entire year, talking about all of the reasons why we don't need to expand K through 12 spending, or if we do, it needs to be in very selected areas and we need to take advantage, advantage of, efficiencies and, of efficiencies in other areas. And so there, there doesn't need to be an overall need in spending. We sort of need to reorient it. You and I can talk all day about that. But politically, if the donor class isn't talking about that, if they aren't pushing back on their representatives, on their legislators on that issue, you and I are just basically talking to ourselves. Because the legislators are going to listen to us to a point, but they're going to listen to their donors more. And if the donors are saying, yeah, yeah, we probably ought to spend more, but just make sure I don't have to pay for it. Um, it, As as long as that's what's going on, we're going to end up spending a lot more. I think think the pushback on the whatever it takes approach, uh, which is what what I hear often from from people who are supporting additional K through 12 spending. We got to spend it whatever it takes. I think the pushback on that uh, is to say, no, if, if, you're, if your point is we need to look after the kids, we need to look after Alaska families, we need to make sure working Alaska families have the opportunities, all the opportunities available to them that you think they ought to have available to them, then we need to spread that cost equitably so that we're just not, we're just not you know, undermining your objective. If you want to make working Alaska families better uh, by spending more, you're, you're going to undo it if you push all of the costs of, of that additional spending off on middle and lower income Alaska families, off on working Alaska families. So to achieve your objective, you've got to spread 
the burden more. You've got to get it. You've got to make sure that all Alaska families are contributing equitably, that the burden is spread broadly so that the so that you minimize the burden on uh, on any one family. And and to me, that has some impact uh, when uh, when when you're pushing back on K through 12 spending because it engages the top 20 percent, the top 20 percent then starts pushing back themselves uh, on K through 12 spending. I guess I would agree with that, except for you and I have been talking about this for years. You and I have been, I mean, we've been talking about this specific argument that this is, and this is not something that the news media is picking up on. It's not something that anybody else is really talking about. And so they can just blame, I mean, you, I know you've talked to the legislator about it. You've, you've, you've written articles. We've talked about it on the program here. I've talked about it. But I, I mean, nobody else seems to be picking up that mantra and talking about what about the equitability of the spread and anything else. And so it just it gets ignored. How do we I mean, how do we make people think about this? I mean, that that's the big thing. I mean, I agree your argument is a sound argument, but it's not getting out there to the common Joe. They don't you know, they don't they're not they're not making these uh, leaps of of logic and and seeing that well, how do we get the the messaging out there because the legislature is not listening to that because they can ignore it because nobody else is picking it up michael i can only uh, we uh, we can only can do what we can do i mean i i, I write the weekly column for the landmine uh, we have the weekly program here part of it is i <laughs> i think conservatives fiscal conservatives need to pick up on that argument i i they want to say that we just shouldn't be spending. And as we saw in this election cycle, that just got rolled over. That position got rolled over. And, and so I think they, people who listen to this program, uh, I think they need to be arguing, fiscal conservatives ought to be arguing, we shouldn't be spending. Put that down as your, as your first marker if you want to. But if we're going to spend, it should be distrib- the cost should be distributed broadly. And, and I think they need, I think fiscal conservatives need to pick up that argument uh, as well. Basically, what, the, what their argument has been this po- to this point is uh, we shouldn't be spending more, full stop, period, end of statement. I don't want to discuss it anymore. That didn't win. That argument doesn't win. We saw in this election cycle, that argument doesn't win. You get rolled over, it, it, at least in this environment, you get rolled over when you make that argument. So to me... We need to have more people making the argument that you shouldn't be spending more, but if you are, make sure you spread it broadly. I think I think more people making that argument uh, would uh, would be helpful. I mean, it, I think it would I think it would motivate maybe Republicans, Republican moderates, who are who are trying to push forward with spending and get away with uh, pushing it all off on middle and lower income Alaska families. Uh, I think it might make uh, might make them think twice, but it's <laughs> yes. You and I have talked about it a lot, uh, but I think to this point, conservatives have have not wanted to go that additional step because they've said it's just enough to say I'm going to s- stop spending. I, I don't I don't think that works. I'm not saying it's the wrong argument, Brad. I'm just saying that you know we've been beating this drum, and yet. There's not, I mean, it, you know, especially in the journalism, I mean, they're not, they're not looking at, it's like they're just taking the talking points and regurgitating them instead of, you know, having some analytical thought on it and say, well, okay, great, but where does the money come from? Where does, you know, who pays and, and all that kind of stuff. I mean, it's just, it seems like more and more, it's just the rubber stamp mill more than anything else. Nobody is really addressing this issue that we keep bringing up. I, you know, it's, 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 it's places like must read. I mean, must read is, 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 uh, uh, for all of its bad, for all of its good and it's bad. It's, it's a broadly read, broadly read publication. And, and must read has been among those who just said no more spending period. End of stop, you know, full stop. That, that's just it. And, and, and I, and I, and I understand why you argue that. I mean, you and I argued that in the early 20 teens, we just shouldn't, we just shouldn't spend more. Until, until to me at least, the, the, the ball just kept going and going and going, and and, and you, I, you had to develop an additional argument. Um, I think must I think must read in places like that need to sort of wake up to this argument. If they continue to just say we don't need to spend more, full stop. That's the end of my that's a, that's the end of my discussion. If you, if you just run over me if you're going to spend more, I don't have any anything else to say. 
then I think they're going to get run over. But but I think that publication and I think other you know Republican talking points need to be, well, we don't think you ought to spend more, but if you're going to spend more, at least distribute it broadly. At least don't focus it on middle and lower income uh, Alaska families. And, and I think that sort of argument, if made more broadly, will start seeping into the, into the public discussion. I, I, I hope so. I really hope so. Because again, the irony of this whole thing is that they supposedly are trying to protect average working class Alaskans. And instead they're stealing the future from average working class Alaskans and their children, uh, because they're, you know, taxing the PFD for all those kids as well. Uh, and so it's, it, it, it it's insane. It, it really is just insane. But you're right. This idea that we're just going to stand there and grumble and say, well, we're just only going to do cuts and that's it. I'm not talking to you anymore. That makes no sense whatsoever, because obviously I mean, it's we're obviously in a minority. I mean, we've talked about this on the program and it's the, been the position, my position for a long time that we should cut. Um, and that, uh, you know, that they're really that should be one of the only options out there. But it's obviously not the winning message it's obviously not what people really want in the long run and 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 michael it's because it's because people like matt clayman are able to go out and say let's spend more and by the way you don't have to pay for it all my donors you don't have to pay for it because i found a way to, to shove it off on middle and lower income alaska families and and so let's spend more you don't have to pay for it you feel guilty about the fact that we're gonna have to close schools and all that sort of stuff so help me spend more you don't have to pay for it and we'll be and we'll be fine it's a it's a different thing if Matt Clayman has to go and say to his donors, help me spend more. You have to pay for a bunch of it, but but help me spend more. You're going to get people pushing back. The donor class, the top 20 percent are going to start pushing back on that. So it's you know, I, I understand I, to me the way that that conservatives can can keep themselves whole in this situation is say first position, don't spend more. But don't stop there because you're, we're getting run over by, by voters. Don't spend more. But if you're going to spend more, at least spread the burden broadly to all, to all Alaska families as opposed to concentrating it on middle and lower income Alaska families. That, to me, should be the conservative message as opposed to just, just don't spend more. And I stop. You know, that's... Right. that's and I'm going to stand in the stand in the doorway. Well, guess what? They just pushed through you when you when you stood in the doorway. You know what would be an, as an interesting thought experiment. What would be interesting is to get all the people who have been no more spending, basically turning around and saying, "Okay, what we need is a broad based tax." Period. That's it. I mean, just you know, we're going to pay for it. Just a broad based tax. Period. That's what we should all get behind. Could you? The ground, the groundswell of a bunch of people saying, "Okay, just give us a broad-based tax," um, and then the screeching that you would hear from the donor class on that side, that would be an interesting. I mean, it's never going to happen, but it would be interesting to see people like me who have been anti up until this point just basically say, "Well, the only solution is to get them all, is to bite them all, bite, put everybody get skin in the game." There you go, boom! Everybody pays a tax. Period. Yeah. And, and, and you don't have to give up the principle of don't spend more. It's, I mean, I, I think it's a two prong. It's don't spend more. You, we don't need to spend more. But if you're going to spend more, make sure it gets spread broadly so it doesn't get focused just on middle and lower income Alaska families. And 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 it's not, you know, go to, please tax me. It is don't tax anybody. Don't spend more. But if you're going to do it, at least make sure that everybody uh, has skin in the game. I think that's a. I think that is th that is a fiscally conservative position. I mean, it is a fiscally responsible position. Don't spend more, but if you're going to do it, at least make sure everybody has skin in the game and everybody's involved in that in that additional spending. I I, I don't. I mean, it's not saying tax me, tax me. It's saying don't tax me, but if you're going to tax me through PFD cuts, if you're going to spend more. Then at least, then at least spread it broadly. Maybe we should just come out and advocate for the tax right now. Just boom, just just go ahead, tax it, broad based tax, make you know, it make it happen. Interestingly enough, the, the people that have spoken about that issue the most are Mike Shower, Shelley Hughes, uh, uh, Rob Myers, <laughs> people who have said 
it, basically, I mean, Shower said in the context of the, of the fiscal policy working group, Hughes has said on and off on various occasions, if you're going to spend more than it needs to be, then it needs to be broadly based. And I, and, and I think that's a very, I think that's a very solid position to take. We didn't even get to number three, Brad. It's sad. It's sad. We'll do it next but time. That's, that's where it is. Thanks, Brad. Appreciate it, Brad. Keith Lee, Alaskans for Sustainable Buzz. Appreciate you coming on board. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the Weekly Top 3 from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages. And keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3.